right, here we are, another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair, local realtor here with Sutton Group Ottawa. And I'm joined today with Jessica Arsenal. Thank you so much. Jessica is a director of marketing and culture. Yeah. Looking at sort of engaging with a lot of those companies and organizations that are looking at hiring and training and all of that. Has there been a time where you essentially looked at that organization and said, we're not a fit. There's definitely times where where you're not a fit for yeah. for each other, and it's there's no animosity when that happens. But sometimes you do discover maybe it's simply a matter of like timing and how much time that client might have for hiring. If they don't have the time and capacity to review profiles, set up interviews, even though they want to hire, it's not going to work yeah. out because yeah. ultimately, if we're you know doing all that work to find the right people, but they can't move on to the next stage. We're not able to serve the candidates or the clients in that situation. Correct. And then you're creating a, a bit of an, well, I don't want to say animosity, but you're creating a little bit of a sour taste in that sort of candidate's mouth, right? Yeah, like it's, it's tough. Hey, we got this hiring manager, but he's not available. She's not available to meet you. And Always keeping people warm. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's the idea. I find like, you know, when you're looking at sort of organizations like yourselves, you guys are really sort of like the middleman and you're having to kind of pander to both sides in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having to keep both sides happy is definitely a challenge. I would say that our, our team are master communicators. And so they're they're able to convey messages in, in a way that is, you know, thoughtful and considerate. So yeah. if they're keeping a candidate waiting, they're doing their best to give them a timeline to know how long they're going to be waiting. And everything's about managing expectations, I think, and and how you position certain information. Because we do, we're in those relationships for the long haul, whether it's on the candidate side or the client side. So for the folks that are watching that are looking at from the candidate side kind of thing, what do they should look for in a company like yourselves? Um, so I would say look for a company that is responsive and is following up with you. Yeah. I in the past I have worked with staffing agencies as a candidate years ago and you know I've had I've been placed by one. I've had experiences where you know they reach out and they're very excited and then they drop off immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's happening and it's right away, it kind of gives you a sense for what your entire interaction <coughs> is going to be like. So I think if you if you feel comfortable and happy and you're getting those responses from the get-go, that, that's what you should lean into. Yeah, and if we're looking at it from looking at it from the uh, other side of it, what should they look for in a company like yourselves? So I would say you definitely want to see an agency that already has a bit of presence and stability within your industry. Yeah. If they don't have any any other clients in your industry, it might be tough for them to understand exactly what your type of organization is. Yeah, absolutely. That's like for example, like. For us, we see this quite often where, you know, you're going into an area, you've never done anything in that area. Right off the bat, my thing is to just be a little bit more blunt. Hey, look, I've never done anything in mm -hmm. this area, but we know what we're doing. We know the market in that area. It's a little bit different versus, no, I know everything about this area and I'm actually the expert in this area and I can take it, no problem. I've had situations where I'm like, you know what, I'm not, I've never sold anything in this area. I think you're better served with this other agent. So that's, and that's just knowing that's you know, something that we've done actually is uh, connecting with other agencies that are kind of like friendly partners to us and like they specialize you know in IT for example and that's exclusively what they do and so having those referrals and it helps build the trust and authenticity with that client too yeah. because they're not being BSed. Uh, when the hiring manager is looking out what's the most important steps that they should take to get the right candidate? So often I find they're very focused on just like years of experience and they'll see we need to hire maybe administrative assistant and they're just focused on get, get developing a job description for that but they don't take the time to look at their team yeah. and see where are the actual holes here and maybe there are certain gaps that somebody with different skill sets might might have so i think being a little too um, like narrowly focused can hold them back because you might actually need an office manager who can do more things and might cost you a little bit more, but you are going to be, everything's going to be going a lot smoother. What's a bad hire in your opinion? I think a bad hire is when the candidate and the client are not in alignment. And it could be that one or the other had a certain requirement, but they didn't know it. And that happens. That happens sometimes yeah. where you go through the process and, you know, you think that you wrote out everything that you needed or wanted. And then you get to week one, week two, and then you think, oh, 
maybe this this isn't quite right. And I've seen that happen, and it doesn't need to be an, an animosity sort of thing. Um, We're just not a fit. Just not a fit, yeah. exactly. And both can move on. And sometimes, like I said, it does occur. So part of our services is we offer like a guarantee period. So during that guarantee period after we make a placement, if it doesn't work out on either side, we'll make sure we replace that person and find the fit that they need. 100%. It is costly to hire somebody and get them up and you know up to speed, if you will, to you know, become actually productive. Mm -hmm. When you look at it from a statistical standpoint, what does that look like for the business? Like if I'm, for example, I'm paying 100 grand for this particular candidate, what do you think the cost would look like percentage wise? I think it is tough to answer because the roles, it's people are guess, not always yeah. revenue generating directly in their, their roles. So it's hard to put a number on that. Like for example, from a sales perspective, I know when I used to hire an AE or account manager or an account executive, um, they would actually cost me about time and a half their salary for the first year. Okay. Right? Because for the first six months, they're definitely not productive. Mm -hmm. And if they are, they're still learning. They're still, there's that curve, right? And I'm, I'm spending more on their... You Your know, own time, which is on, money too. Exactly. Yep. And then spending on resources that are, again, you know, getting them their logins, getting them education, doing all of that stuff. They're spending probably at least two and a half months at the beginning just learning the product. Because I'm not hiring for necessarily the, just a skill. I'm also hiring for the culture, which is the biggest thing, is like finding that culture. And then sometimes we're having to teach them the skill mm -hmm. to, to get there. You want to see them embody that and then be able to go yeah. out on their own, but it takes a lot of building up to get Correct. to that point. Correct. And then uh, as long as I know that, you know what, the culture fits just fine, I'm okay with taking them, even if they're going to take me a little bit longer to teach them the skill. Because mm -hmm. I can always teach that skill. You see the potential. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it just, I guess, depends on from role to role, what kind of role they are. And then like if you, you know, as you mentioned there, if they are revenue generating or not, that just kind of makes a, a little bit of a difference for sure. Mm -hmm. For TAG to be successful at what they do, they've obviously been following a mantra, following some sort of a, um, you know, I want to call it like the vision. What's that vision look like for TAG? Well, I would say... Prioritizing our relationships is number one for us. We're, we're all about the long term. Um, I think a lot of agencies can kind of go into a situation and only have the mindset of being quick. And when you do that, sometimes you can have certain relationships fall to the side if yeah. you haven't you know, closed the loop, been transparent. And so that leads me into the next value, which is transparency. Um, another thing that we like to say internally is a Brene Brown piece. It's clear as kind. So being direct and being very clear in your communication is the best thing that you can do. Whether you're working with your colleagues internally, with a candidate, with a client, you've got to be up front because it just, one, it saves a lot more time, builds trust, and it allows you to work together productively. Yeah, yeah. And there's something to be said about being clear. Like, a, you know, you're not wasting time. Yeah. There is that. There's also that the kind piece of it is that if I'm not stringing somebody along, um, I'm definitely just making it easier on them to, to say, like, this is not a good fit for me. I mm -hmm. shouldn't be in this sort of relationship, regardless if it's a business or personal. It's just like, yeah, that's the kind piece. I really appreciate that, that you're, you guys are kind of going back to it. We kind of um, tease out the difference between, like, being nice versus being kind. And often people will say being nice is actually serving you um, because you're maybe avoiding certain direct things that might be more conflict oriented yeah. potential but being kind is considering the other person 100%. their time and where you want to end up and it, it's also just kind of setting the expectations properly right mm -hmm. like if, you know if you're being nice sometimes you might just kind of you, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to the other person in a way 100%. because you just don't want to upset them so you're just going along you might be a little bit of a people pleaser but then you're you know you're dropping the ball later on versus where you know, trying to be kind and clear, uh, you're essentially just saying like, this is not going to work for me or this is going to work for me. And if it's going to work, here's the steps and here's the clear path of where, how we're going to get it there. You got it. It's a lot Great. easier to win together when you're clear. Exactly. Exactly. With that being said, I just want to go back to some of the community stuff that you guys have been doing lately. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that community engagement. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the plans for TAG for more community engagement and how could someone get you guys involved? Absolutely. So we have been trying to lean into more like charity engagement, show where our heart is in the community. 
Um, what I would love to see is individuals within the company and something that we're trying to encourage is to kind of like find your organization. And then we can rally the team around that. Um, so to find organizations that are close to your values and what you want to champion, and then let's all get on board to help that cause. So for me, one organization that I've gotten involved with is, is Youth Services Bureau. Um, so this year they started a Young Professionals Network. I'm helping out with that to raise awareness for the foundation. And the team has been amazing in helping out. Um, so we did the coldest walk of the, the year, or sorry, coldest night of the year walk um, this year. And we were able to help raise some money for them, get out, enjoy some time in the cold together. Um, so I want to encourage more of that throughout our team. Um, we have a number of us are involved with certain organizations and love to show up at events like Beyond Networking, Rendezvous. So it is multi-pronged in terms of you know, charitable engagement, showing up with other business community members, hearing what they're struggling with, learning from them. It's always, it's always engaging and motivating when you mm -hmm. get to make those connections. So it all does tie together because when you make those connections at the events, you get to learn about other organizations that need support and could benefit. Yeah. What's like? What do you see? Sort of like the the common denominator when it comes to hiring, that's a lot of organizations having issues with. It still comes back to the hybrid remote piece, and I, I know it seems repetitive almost to keep coming back to this now that we're kind of post COVID and things are more open. But certain industries are very tied to that in office attendance. They want to see people there even up to five days a week. But like I said before, the candidates don't. They don't want to do that. Um, so there is a big tension when they're looking to bring on senior staff. But those senior staff members or that candidate network base, they've earned the privilege and flexibility to work when they want, where they want, and they don't want to give that up. So Thank it's you. it's hard to get through to those those restrictive attitudes sometimes. Um, but you know, shedding light on the candidate side, it does help break that down. Mm -hmm. And when we're looking at uh, some of the sort of the nuances that come with with those organizations as far as like breaking the mold, if you will. Mm -hmm. That's one of them. Uh, but what are some of the sort of the symptoms that you see as far as uh, changing the culture within the hiring community? Right. The organizations that are focusing on offering those extras are doing a lot better when it comes to bringing in the talent quickly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I said before, it comes down to finances often. But it doesn't always need to be just in your salary. Maybe people want to see their retirement fund matching. Yeah. Maybe they want to have their professional fees covered. Mm -hmm. They want to know that they're going to receive a bonus, possibly based on performance, but that's motivating. Um, it's not always just about the strict salary compensation. Yeah. It's about how else are you supporting that person? Do you have an employee assistance plan where they could you know, have counseling, maybe financial guidance? There's a lot of other things that people want to see from their employers nowadays. I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I wanted to kind of mention some of the work. I'll ask you the question first and then I'll see if there is space to mention this. With regards to negotiating a salary or negotiating some sort of a package, what's the best way to set yourself up as a candidate to negotiate the best terms and conditions for yourself? Should know what your absolute lowest is and obviously go in higher so that you can meet in the middle. And I think knowing what your non-negotiables are, being super upfront about that. So what we do with our, our candidates is we'll, it's called like we'll market them. So we'll share like a blind profile with our clients when we've got a really great candidate who's looking for work. And we're trying to like get them interested to have that discussion we'll put their must-haves in that profile right away. So like, if they will not entertain um, coming into the office, we'll be sure right away to be like remote only. And I think it comes back to that transparency piece, sets the expectations right away. And so if you as a candidate know right away what those must-haves are, you've yeah. got to be super upfront, either in your own applications, if you're working with the recruiter, let them know. I think other, um, other things are knowing where else you've applied um, and being very transparent about that as well. It also mm -hmm. helps. Yeah, going back to that same sort of clear is kind mm -hmm. definitely makes sense. Um, when you're also clear about what you can and what you can't sort of waver on, it, it makes it a lot easier for you to negotiate as well too. Yeah. So part of my, uh, my negotiation tactics when I used to look into hiring or not hiring, but like applying for different kind of jobs and what have you, uh, a lot of the times, it's not just about the funds or the money uh, per se. Like I would I'd actually write down, okay, so this new job, I'm looking for this and this and this and this. 
here's the financials that I'm looking for, and my range is from this to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes we might not be able, like we, we might be very close on the range or like I maybe a little bit more than I what I wanted, which is great. But instead of pushing on that, what I would push on instead is maybe getting an extra week of vacation. Yeah, that's a great way to, to shed light on the other things that you can negotiate yeah. because it isn't always about that hard number. What else is going to make you happy? Yeah. Do you have personal days in your package? Do you want more freedom to work remotely mm -hmm. in another country maybe? Exactly. Um, I find also some candidates, they want to know from the, the possible employer, what is it going to look like for me? Like, how are you measuring success? Exactly. Is that, you know, at a three-month point, a six-month point, 12-month point, when do we have our first formal review? Mm -hmm. Knowing that up front also helps them understand the, the full scope and be very confident going into it. So from a candidate standpoint, I want to ask you um, a list of, maybe not a list, maybe like the top one or two questions that a candidate should definitely ask when they're going into an interview. For me, it would be, number one, what does the onboarding process look like? Making sure that they have it fully fleshed out, they've got a good idea for what it will look like personalized to you, and then tying into that second piece, you know, how, how will I be successful, in your opinion, mm -hmm. so that you know what sort of metrics you're going to be evaluated on as a new person coming into that company. And I would often, uh, I would encourage people to ask rather what that success looks like within the first couple of months versus what it looks like within like a year of being yeah. comfortable within the company. Not everybody can answer those questions, no. but it does open up a very healthy discussion. A lot of the times I find when we're going in for jobs, it's always about the interview questions, the interview questions. And a lot of the times, I think, in my opinion, it has to be a two-way interview. Yes. What are I your think thoughts on when that? When you get to the end of the interview and the candidate has not, you know, interjected and asked questions, had any at the end, it's probably not a very strong interview. Mm -hmm. The best ones I find are when you leave with a big smile on your face because you feel like you just had a conversation with a new friend. You know, you're, you hear something, a question that they ask, you answer, you ask them a question, like, this makes me think, how would you handle this issue in your organization? Yeah. You know, like, turning it back on them, not in a pointed way, but because you're genuinely curious and interested, I feel like those are the ones that leave the best impressions on both sides. 100%. With looking at the employer side of things, what are some of the questions that you think an employer absolutely should ask? It so actually it leads into one of our marketing things we have coming up next week. We're actually releasing a blog post about behavioral questions mm -hmm. and the power of those in hiring. So a lot of people will focus on skills, experience, you know, where did you learn this skill? You were at this company for X amount of time. Why did you leave? Very traditional. Behavioral questions, putting them into an actual situation and learning what they did, what was their thinking behind it. I would say leaning that way and making sure you have a balance of both, yeah. that's what you want to do. And so, I find also like when it comes to behavioral questions, it's a lot easier to discern if they're actually done the job or not Yeah. by asking those questions because it, it has to draw on memory. Like I've done this before, I'm answering it from the situation that I've handled mm -hmm. versus what would you do in this situation is a little bit different, right? Like yeah, tell me about a situation, for example, tell me a story about, you know, when you hired this individual, what did the process look like? It's really easy for me to tell you because that's a, a story mm -hmm. and it's something that I've already experienced versus what would you do in a situation like this? It's I'm going to come up with something on the fly. Anyone can do that hypothetical exactly. for sure, but you get to learn more about the candidate when you hear the story, how they deliver it. You can probe what was their thinking? How did they solve a problem? And it doesn't need to be like those you know, the ones that feel like trick questions where it's like, what are your three greatest weaknesses? It doesn't need to be like yeah. that where you're trying to you know, draw out the negatives, you can give them a, a space to shine their strengths, but learning about their approach, that's where all the meat is. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I wanted to kind of leave the audience on, you did mention that you've got this blog post coming up about behavioral. Mm -hmm. How often does TAG share stuff like this with their clients and their, uh, you know, folks that are on their newsletter and all of that? So right now we're about once a month for our blog posts. We're looking to increase that as we get uh, further into the year. 
Um, another thing we've been doing more recently is more videos. Mm -hmm. So Sarah on our team, she's our, our new sales and marketing assistant. She's fantastic. Um, she has experience working at Algonquin, doing student services and like sharing her own self using TikTok and all of that. So she's very comfortable being out there in terms of video. She recently did a post for us that was all behind the scenes on what happens when you apply to a job. So as a candidate, if you, you know, share yourself on LinkedIn to a job posting, you know, click that easy apply. What what is next for yeah. the recruiters? Yeah. What do they see? And not a lot of candidates will be able to see that back end of like recruiter professional services. What is the, what do what are the parts of the profile that stand out when you're yeah. applying? Yeah. And so we're trying to kind of, you know, open the curtain a little bit, give more more sense and understanding for the audience. And it's been very well received. I think that's one of our best videos so far this year. Amazing. Amazing. Exciting. Yeah. We get that quite often, like just kind of figuring out the process. Because everyone knows, for example, like if, when I apply, okay, there's an interview, there's this. But just knowing sort of the intricacies that comes to it mm -hmm. makes it a lot more, I guess, simpler, a lot more uh, enticing to for apply. Sure. Um, with that being said, I'd love for the folks to kind of just, you know, check out your blog post and things like that. What's the best way to find it? Taghr.com. Tag yeah. Perfect. Um, again, Jessica, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Um, we could probably talk for another couple of hours. I know Easy. that for a I'm fact. I'm sure we will after. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm so um, glad to have taken part. Thank you so much. And thanks for uh, Tag HR for allowing us the time to, uh, to come in today. And folks that you're watching, if you like what you see, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe and hit that bell icon so you can get more and more uh, alerts about episodes like this and learn about businesses that are in the city of Ottawa and learn that this city is fantastic. It's not boring. There's so much to do and there's so much to learn. And uh, you find it here first. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you.